can I ask uh, Professor Megan Davis and Auntie Juliana to come up on stage, take a seat. In 2012, FECA was proud to be the first organisation in Australia to sign an accord with the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, recognising and supporting Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as First Peoples of Australia. FECA believes multiculturalism begins with recognising the rights and place in society held by Australia's First Peoples and the rich cultural heritage that their communities have long nurtured. I believe that we cannot advance multicultural Australia without first being good allies to our First Nations brothers and sisters. As FECA, it is our duty to show leadership and encourage our members and our communities to embrace the Uluru Statement from the heart. It is our duty to lead by example and create a space for our communities to learn and take more action. Today's opening plenary is dedicated to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. In 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart invited Australians, Australian people to walk with First Nations peoples in a movement for a better future. In this keynote session, Professor Megan Davis will discuss the Uluru Statement and the pathway to a voice to Parliament protected by the Constitution. Auntie Juliana will respond to Professor Davis's call with her personal thoughts on First Nations justice in Australia and what the Uluru Statement means to her as a leader in multicultural Australia. A um, couple of housekeeping. Um, we are using Slido for q and I encourage you to uh, submit your questions throughout the speech. Um, they will come up on screen and you, you get the chance to upvote which questions you'd like me to put to the, to the speakers. Um, Hopefully the Slido details will come up. Um, enter the code. For those not familiar with Slido or um, can't access Slido, uh, there will be a couple of roving microphones um, that you can just put your hand up. One of our lovely staff will come to you and uh, will take questions. Um, OK, our first speaker is Professor Megan Davis. Professor Megan Davis is a proud Cobble Cobble Aboriginal woman from Southeast Queensland and Southeast Islander descent. She's the Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous UNSW, and Professor of Law, UNSW Law. In 2010, she became the first Indigenous Australian woman to be elected to a United Nations body when she was appointed to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Professor Davis was, the, was on the Australian Government's expert panel on the country's Indigenous people in 2011 and was the member of the Prime Minister's Referendum Council from 2015 to 2017. As a member of the Referendum Council, Megan was instrumental in assisting the development of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. She is also the co-chair of the Uluru Dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Megan. Thanks, Edda. No said break a leg, but I'm the kind of person who would, so I was like, don't, don't say that. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad that this is the more informal part of the proceedings. It's a bit intimidating with all those very important people and still very important people in the room. Um, so um, as a Cobble Cobble woman from the Barangam Nation, um, uh, I just wanted to pay my respects to um, the owners, traditional owners of country that we're meeting on and their elders past and present and also just acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room today. Um, I felt very privileged to be invited to speak at this um, conference, um, and Mo, thank you for the invitation. Um, we've been speaking for a long time now about how we, as First Nations peoples, can engage um, our culturally and linguistically diverse brothers and sisters in this movement of the Australian people um, to achieve the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I should also say I'm a Logan kid. I grew up in Eagleby and Beanley in South East Queensland. Um, very huge you know, multicultural communities up there. We always talk about us, um, we're very kind of low socioeconomic area, that we always think of ourselves as the worker bees of social cohesion in Australia, and I think that's very true and something that we've spoken about a lot. Um, and so, again, that just, um, I think, reiterates how um, honoured I feel to speak today. I'm going to explain a bit about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, we're aware um, now that the Albanese government has committed to a referendum um, that there is much community education to be done and 
we, we, we talked about this and I um, accepted this talk without knowing that that wonderful election night, um, the new Prime Minister would commit to a, to a referendum to recognise First Nations people in the Constitution. I was one of the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who participated in the Uluru National Constitutional Convention in 2017. Um, but my participation was even earlier than that. I, um, I was a member of the Referendum Council, as Mo said, who designed the dialogue process that engaged the community on what form of constitutional recognition um, would be meaningful to them. Um, but I'd also previously served on Julia, Prime Minister Julia Gillard's expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian Constitution. So since 2011, when Prime Minister Gillard set up the um, expert panel, we have had, um, well, 11 years, it's, it's a long time. We've had seven processes and, and 10 reports. You know, we've had an expert panel that produced one report, a joint select committee led by Ken Wyatt and Nova Paris, who produced three reports. We had an act of recognition. We had John Anderson's review. Um, he produced a report we had the Referendum Council that produced the Uluru Statement from the Heart and a report. We had another Joint Select Committee that looked into the Uluru Statement from the Heart, checked its methodology and its um, process and the recommendations, led by um, Senator Patrick Dodson and Julian Lisa. Um, that produced two reports, including a huge amount of information about what the voice would look like. And then in the last term of government, we had Minister Wyatt lead a co-design process on what a voice would look like and he produced two reports also. So it has been a long time. It's been a decade of a lot of work. Um, and now we have a commitment to a referendum. It's, um, it's very historic. Um, and they say constitutional reform can never, this is all over the world, can never be predicted, but there'll be a once in a lifetime, once in a blue moon moment when you get leadership, a constitutional moment, they call it. But it usually takes a leader to step up and say, I'm gonna do that. And that's what Anthony Albanese did on the night of the election. So I'm going to talk a bit about what's constitutional recognition, so why is it on the table? What's the history here of the Uluru constitutional dialogues? Um, how are they conducted? And I'll, I'll touch upon the, the notion of dissent and disagreement and how that was captured in that work. And then talk a bit about, you know, what is voice? What is voice Makarata? And then end with the statement. And we have the original painting from out at the rock just to the right, and we have some young Aboriginal leaders who are here who'll bring it up um, as I read the Uluru Statement to you. So Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples in Australia have been advocating for recognition of rights since the very early colonial period, so during the colonial governments. Um, and so we tracked it back to about the 1830s, 1840s in our research. And we've advocated for multiple forms of recognition. So recognition isn't just one thing. Um, but, but the prominent thing since the 1830s has been how Indigenous populations can have a more enhanced participation in the democratic life of the colonial governments and then the government post-Federation. So that's a really important point to make. Um, how, how did our people and our polities, how do we influence and adapt to that structure that would, had been opposed, imposed upon us? Um, and that, that still sits alongside our advocacy for recognition of our own rights and customs. And you can see that's how a voice and treaty sit alongside each other. One is about how you work with the democratic, with the state and liberal governance, and the other is about how you get recognition of your own customs, traditions and culture. So many liberal democracies have different forms of uh, recognition. It's a really common way that the settler state engages with indigenous populations. And I have been an expert on the UN for 12 years now and studied a lot of these um, approaches. And with my UN hat on, there's probably 70 substantive states in the world in the UN system that have indigenous, substantive indigenous populations. And the bulk of them have some kind of voice to parliament. They have some kind of mechanism. Some have voices in Parliament, like reserved seats and designated seats, but a lot have mechanisms that are 
allow Indigenous populations, First Nations, to influence um, the parliament. And, and the reason why reserved seats and designated seats aren't as popular as the voices to the parliament is because, by and large, First Nations people don't want to be within that parliamentary system. That's not to um, um, disavow the important role that our Indigenous po politicians play, but they represent their constituency and their party. They don't represent um, their Indigenous nation in that representative sense. So recognition is a really complex legal and political concept. There's voluminous you know, amounts of writing and PhDs and books written on this topic. Um, but its dictionary meaning um, is actually just acknowledgement. Um, but it can also mean substantive reform to power relations. And that's what we're looking at when we talk about recognition, because symbolic recognition was rejected outright at the Uluru Statement, um, in the Uluru Statement, and, and during the dialogues and at the final meeting. Um, people do not want symbolism. They want something substantive that will make a change. So recognition sits on a spectrum, and at one end is a weak end of recognition, and at the other end is a strong form of recognition. So the weak end of, of a recognition spectrum is symbolism, and symbolism's important, we, we accept that, but it can't compel the state to do anything, and it can't stop the state from doing anything. It is symbolism. But at the end, the strong end of this, the recognition spectrum, um, is more substantive forms of recognition because they can compel the state to do things and they can stop the state from doing things. So there's multiple kinds of recognition and we took a number of forms of recognition that were agreed to by the Prime Minister at the time and the opposition leader out to communities and asked the question, what is meaningful recognition to you? So treaties recognition, statutory land rights is recognition, native title is recognition. These are all forms of recognition. So up until the Uluru process began, Australia's public discussion about recognition was mostly about acknowledgement. And that's because there was no model on the table. So after the Gillard government's process, they didn't, not, not just the Labor government, but the incoming Liberal government, they didn't commit to anything. So there was no model. Um, and they set up a campaign called the Recognise Campaign and, and it promoted what looked like symbolism because there was no model on the table. But this was very unsettling for most in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. It was so unsettling that we asked, we, we met with Prime Minister Abbott, it, myself, Noel Pearson, Patrick Dodson, and Kirsty Parker, who was the head of the National Congress, which Mo um, just referred to. We said to Abbott, you can't go to a referendum on symbolism because the community will vote no. Um, and he, what he did was commit to a new process. So we, by now we were halfway down a decade of recognition, but we hadn't gone out and actually asked in a deliberative fashion to communities, what is it that you want? So we were retrofitting consultation halfway through that decade. Um, and that's, that is what the Referendum Council's work was. Um, and that is where the Uluru Statement came from. So Abbott set up a meeting at Kirribilli mid-2015 with Bill Shorten, and we met in Sydney, and there were 40 significant First Nations leaders from across the country there, and we said that we would not support symbolism. We would not support constitutional housekeeping you know, that removed the word race because it was offensive, but actually didn't change the lives of anyone on the ground. Yeah, we wanted actual tangible change. So a minimalist approach, we did not support. It did not go far enough and would not be acceptable. We asked for a dialogue, a dialogue between the government and First Nations peoples um, to work on the proposal and then march towards the referendum, which had been the bulk of the work up until that time. How do you get Australia to a referendum? So Abbott lost prime ministership and we got Malcolm Turnbull and he set up the referendum council. So the job was go out to communities and ask them what is meaningful recognition look like? We were fenced in obviously by different things that the prime minister said, like he had to sign off on the options. 
Um, so that we were fenced in to a certain degree. Um, but we also got additional things added to the dialogue process, such as a voice to parliament and a treaty, or agreement making, I should call it. So I'll move now to what were the dialogues and how were they conducted. So these are the First Nations regional dialogues. They are historic because it's the first time that First Nations peoples have been asked to participate in constitution building in, in actually discussing the constitution because we were excluded from the process in the 1880s. My scarf is falling on. Um, we were excluded in the 1880s. Um, and not just that, in terms of the participation and drafting of the Australian constitution, we were expressly excluded in the text of the constitution and that, that wasn't fixed until 1967. So, we sat down um, in the initial phase. Patrick Dodson was our chair at that point. Noel Pearson, Arnie Pat Anderson, myself, and a group of First Nations peoples who'd been selected to that committee. And we thought, how do we go out to communities in an era of tick and flick consultation? So they were inundated by state and territory and Commonwealth bureaucrats who we know don't know how to talk to our communities or consult them. Um, and they were in this wave of tick and flick consultation where bureaucrats fly in, have a meeting for an hour, give, them, give community sandwiches and then fly out that afternoon. And community were not in a good, they were not in a good mood. I mean, this morning um, was intimidating, but those dialogues, all 13 of them in the National Convention, is far more intimidating, I can assure you. Um, but also in 2014, the Abbott government introduced a new policy in, into Indigenous affairs called the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, which saw the total dismantling of the Aboriginal sector. It saw the removal of all of the black money from across the Commonwealth bureaucrat, uh, bureaucracy, and it was all put into one bucket. Um, and you saw the falling over of really significant self-determination programs that Whitlam had supported in, in 1973. You saw the dismantling of night patrols and lots of kind of iterations of self-determination that communities had created. And that money went into a bucket and you had to apply for it to get it back. And as the Australian National, National Audit Office tells us, something like 80% went to non-Indigenous organisations. And a large bulk of it went to corporations with reconciliation action plans to fund their wraps. Um, not just that, you know, the Department of Science, bureaucracies in Darwin, they all got funded out of the IAS and our people got defunded. So we went into the community at a period where people were really angry. They'd lost housing, um, funding, um, employment, you name it. In places like Yarrabah, 40 minutes outside of Cairns, they lost all their programs and still have only, they've still not got anything back under the IAS. But their cultural programs are now, um, they, the, the Commonwealth funded uh, Save the Children who drove 40 minutes from Cairns out to Yarrabah to deliver programs that communities used to deliver themselves. And the only IAS project that's ever been approved there is a hall for the police station. Um, and so you can see when we went into communities, they were, not, they were not happy. And so we had to work out a way of asking them to talk about the constitution, right? I mean, Australia generally has a very low level of constitutional and civic literacy. Um, experts say our civic literacy is so low because we have compulsory voting. And, and they say that influences the kind of disengagement with the political system outside of the, the three-year terms. Um, we do try to improve the levels of civic literacy, but, they, but they, are, they are low. So we had to go out to communities and say, oh, can we talk to you for three days about the Australian Constitution? It, it doesn't go down well. Um, so there were a number of things that we needed to keep in mind when designing the dialogues. The fact that we were collectives, so we are, we are nations, we're not individuals. So the Western ballot box system doesn't always suit communities. Um, the land is everything. The land base is everything, which is why we engage Aboriginal land councils to run the dialogues. We, we're a gerontocracy, so our leaders are our elders. There are old people. So we needed to privilege the meetings with um, our traditional, old, old, traditional owners and 
our elders and our community because they carry all of the wisdom. We're regionally distinct, we're linguistically diverse, we have weather issues all across the continent. We have ceremony, so there's parts where, where you can't go to parts of the country because of ceremony. And it needed to be driven by the community. So all of these factors had to go into how to design the dialogues. So that's why we took, so we took a whole year. Um, by the end of 2016, the Australian newspaper's like, where's these dialogues? Waste of taxpayer time. But we actually took a whole year to design it. And then we rolled it out month after month up until the Uluru Convention in 2017. Um, so what we did is we designed a process that was based on deliberative constitutional processes in Ireland and other places. Um, a deliberative process that would enable our people to drive the dialogue so we wouldn't be up the front, you know, driving it. Um, it, would be dri it would be driven by local people. So we developed a tightly structured civics program so we had to deal with the civics issue first. Then we did a lengthy legal lecture about the law, the legal system and the options on the table. And then the groups went through an assessment of the legal options for reform from the expert panel and the Joint Slick um, Parliamentary Committee. They were the, that, that is what Turnbull agreed to and Shorten agreed to. We wrote to them, they signed it off. So we started in 2016 travelling around the country, consulting with our communities. We ran meetings in Broome with traditional owners, Thursday Island with um, our national peaks, and also in Melbourne with key leaders in the struggle. We walked them through the whole design of the dialogue, the questions, the videos, the lectures, everything, and we got critique, a lot of critique, no, a lot of good critique too, um, critique, feedback, and we got the sign-off to run the dialogues. We had originally planned to do them in 32 sites, mirroring ATSIC, that's where that number 32 comes up all the time um, in Aboriginal affairs discussion. The Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission had worked with the Australian Electoral Commission to determine what electorates are most closely matched to cultural kind of footprints. 32 is that number, um, but, but um, Turnbull cut our money substantially, so we could only run 12. Um, and so we had to choose what regions that we thought um, would make the outcome a robust outcome. So we engaged the Aboriginal Institute of, um, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS, to, to manage the logistics so that we weren't. So they engaged the land councils and they helped the land councils put together the invitation list. So the First Nations Regional Dialogues were convened in Hobart by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation, in Broome by the Kimberley Land Council, in Dubbo by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, in Darwin by the Northern Land Council, in Perth by the South West Aboriginal uh, Land and Sea Council, in Sydney again by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, in Melbourne by the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners Corporation, in Cairns by the North Queensland Land Council, in Ross River by the Central Land Council, in Adelaide by the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement, in Brisbane by a number of local organisations, and on Thursday Island by the Torres Shire Council and a number of Torres Strait Regional organisations. And then we had a truncated dialogue um, hosted in Canberra by the United Ngunnawal Elders Council. Which, which a large number of the treaty uh, embassy attended and were elected to the national um, convention. So this process, as I said, is unprecedented in Australian history. You know, it's the first time something's been convened by um, and for First Nations peoples. Uh, we engaged um, 1,500 delegates, the average of about 100 delegates. It went up and down for, for some of the dialogues, um, but we needed to keep the numbers capped to an order that the outcome at the end was, ro was robust. It's the most proportionately significant consultation process that's ever been undertaken um, in relation to public law in this way. It engaged a greater population or proportion of the relevant population than the constitutional convention debates that I referred to in the 1800s from which we were excluded. We, we partly modelled the whole process on the constitutional centenary 
foundation framework. So we worked with a lot of uh, non-Indigenous um, leaders and constitutional lawyers who were involved in that in the 1990s. And the core characteristics were impartiality, accessibility of relevant information. So we, we worked with a lot of interpreters and translated a lot of the material to other languages. Open and constructive dialogue and mutually agreed and owned outcomes. So the whole dialogue was based on tension and disagreement. Because our community is like any other community, we don't agree on everything, we don't. Um, rugby league, AFL, and then everything else. Um, so it was designed in a way that you capture conversation, then the agreement, the disagreement, the tensions. We recorded all of that in what we call a record of meeting. So any objections, agreements, disagreements were captured in a record of meeting which everybody signed off on the last day. Everybody had to own the outcome and everybody ensured that their view was there. And that's how we got to a consensus at Uluru. Uluru was an interesting methodology once you got to the rock because the people elected to the rock couldn't overturn what had been done in, in the regions. So the regions had told us, we don't have a voice. So they said, you know, peak organisations don't talk for us. The Aboriginal people in parliament lobbying politicians from major community control orgs, they don't represent us. No one speaks for us. No one comes back and tells us, what are you spending that budget on? What did you say in my name in Canberra? They, they said, no one speaks for us. So the last thing we, we were gonna do was to go to, Can go to Uluru and allow that group of people to overturn what had been done in, in the regions. So Uluru was simply the reading out of the records of meetings of each region. No one had heard what the other region had done. No one had heard, heard to the rock. And that's where the remarkable synergy emerged, the consensus around the voice to parliament. Um, and yes, it did upset those who solely seek and advocate for a treaty, but in a process which was fair and worked very hard to ensure people were informed that they had a voice that they could talk in a safe environment, a process that prevented groupthink, because one of the biggest concerns we heard in 26 from communities is that the loudest will come into the room, shout, nobody will feel comfortable to give their view, and everyone will just agree with what the loudest said. And we needed to ensure that groupthink and, and, and those kinds of... Um, agendas didn't dominate, that people had an opportunity to participate. So what we saw then um, was uh, what I think is a remarkable consensus coming out of every single region. The voice to parliament was number one. Um, agreement making treaty people would find surprising didn't rank number one in, in across the board, and in fact it ranked last in those areas where treaty making is, or agreement making is really common. Because agreement making is very legalistic, um, it's a lot of work, and it takes a long time to see benefit. So it's unsurprising in those places where you've got strong native title and land rights, that they saw agreement making not as their priority, but they saw the voice as the priority. So let me just give you a little bit of information about the voice. The voice to parliament is something we've advocated for a very long time, as I've said, but one of the problems is they're continually abolished. We've had for CATSI, NAC, NACC, ATSIC, Congress, we've had something like six voices since 1957 and they've all been shut down or abolished. One of the overriding principles of the discussion about the voice was, one, we feel voiceless and powerless in our own communities and, and we want to have a better and direct say in what's going on um, in the parliament in our name. So the group discussed how the voice could operate as a front end political limit on the parliament's power to pass laws that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 
mostly under section 5126, the races power, and under section 122, the plenary power that affects the territories. They appreciated that this model would not guarantee that these powers would not be used against them in the future in a negative discriminatory way, but it would create a limit through political empowerment, which would hopefully achieve better design policies in the future. So yes, we discussed in the dialogues that you can't veto the parliament. No one can except the High Court of Australia, but there are many influential entities that speak to the parliament, like the Australian Human Rights Commission, for example, or the Australian National Audit Office, for example, or the Productivity Commission, and nobody says that they are weak. What we're doing here is to leverage not just legal power, but political power. We're trying to leverage both. So the voice will, in, will um, involve the insertion into the Australian constitution of an enabling provision. So not the bricks and mortar of the voice, not the design of the voice, but just an enabling provision that says the Australian parliament has the power to create a First Nations voice and its functions and objects will be determined by the parliament in consultation with First Nations peoples. And so it's set up, it will be set up after it's designed. That provision is like the High Court of Australia. It was inserted into the Australian constitution in 1901, the enabling provision, but the bricks and mortar of the High Court weren't established until three years later. So it's the same kind of mechanism. So Mo's just told me to shut up, but I have one thing to do. I have to read the Uluru Statement. Yes. <laughs> He's like, so um, I'll, I'll just introduce the Uluru Statement from the heart. I think that the girls are going to bring it up. Just to make the point that, you know, at Uluru, we had invited politicians like the Prime Minister of Office to come to the Rock to receive the Uluru Statement. But there at The Rock, we changed our minds and decided, no, if we do that, they're just going to hang that in Parliament House like they have everything else. And in fact, I did a Q&A after Uluru and they brought out the Barunga Statement in a per per Perspex box. And I'm like, you haven't implemented any of it. You don't, you don't wheel it out. Um, and so we decided, actually, you know what? The only way we're going to get this ha to happen is if we ask the Australian people to support us, like they did in 1967. And so the Uluru Statement is what we call, um, some call it an olive branch, we call it an invitation, we call it an act of friendship, a sign of peace. And I think that's a powerful thing because after everything that has happened to my people, after everything has happened to First Nations people, the killings, the massacres, the genocide, the compulsory racial segregation for almost a century, the stealing of children, the stealing of wages, the contemporary manifestation and Aboriginal child removal and youth suicide and incarceration. After everything that has come before, our old people at The Rock, they chose love. They spoke of love and they spoke of peace. And this is the invitation that they have issued to all of you in the room here to walk with us. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom, remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history 
in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and to take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. <clears throat> we leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. And we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, we hear your call, and we will do all we can um, as, a, as uh, multicultural communities um, to stand with you as allies, and we will get there. Wonderful. Can I just remind people, Slido is up. Please submit your questions. They're coming nice and slow. Um, and we are running very late, and I'll try and do, do a much better chairing job. OK. Our next speaker is Auntie Juliana. Since arriving from Ghana in 1988, Juliana Nkrumah AM has been a leader for women with the African community in Australia. From founding the African Women Australia to serving on numerous boards, including the uh, Australian National Committee on Refugee Women, she has continually strived to give voice to women from both migrant and refugee communities. Her focus has been on education and empowerment, promoting self-representation and encouraging women to speak for themselves. She has been applauded for her role in raising awareness on the practice of female genital mutilation in Australia and convening the first national conference on the issue. She was awarded the member of the Order of Australia in 2013 for her significant community work. She's passionate about mig the migrant journey and the need to do more with our First Nations people. Please welcome Auntie Juliana. Well, good morning. All protocols observed. That's what my people say, because our time is going. And it's a shame that our time is running out. I would like to call us to be patient, because this is a very, very important moment. Don't you think so? Thank you. Professor Megan Davis. Such an honor to be sharing the podium with you. In Kylie Minogue's words, I should be so lucky. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a rollout. Congratulations to Mohammed and your FECA team. I didn't know how to work this PowerPoint. Can you give me the next slide? The next one, please. Midi di Okay, so, oh yeah, mine. 
Ochinkra. That is me, my name. So when I mention my name, not Juliana, I'm Pofua. She who speaks to the point of tears, her truth. The one who pulls nations and draws hearts. That's the sum of who I am when I was born and the purpose for which I tread this earth. Then I was sent to a Wesleyan school. And in that school, which is now 186 years old, I was given a motto. For seven years, I lived under that motto. Live pure, speak true, write wrong, follow the king. Embedding a key sense of social justice, I come riding on the shoulders of millions of migrant and refugee women and peoples into this space, to this land, to this place. We arrived to this sacred land, home to the world's oldest continuous cultures, yet most of us did not stop to pay attention to the owners, the traditional owners. We got on with our lives. Megan, today, this moment, we say sorry. We have heard your invitation very clearly. This was the invitation that caught our hearts. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast land, this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in the movement of the Australian people for a better future. A tagline that I hear with that is, will you walk with us. And I say in response to that, following Obama's election campaign, yes, we will. But what does that mean? My task is to bring the response from the Australian multicultural perspective. This group, like the diverse indigenous Australians, is a very diverse group. You know that. To make it easier, permit me to draw from personal stories what is blatantly obvious about multicultural Australia is that we have come to this land that is unceded. Many of us have come from countries and lands with colonial history, and yet on arrival, we brought into the colonial project, which is Australia. What is it? What does it look like? Well, number one, denial. I did not create this problem. I'm not white, I'm not white. Well, this is a very nice way of abrogating our responsibility for participating from a distance in the prevailing narratives. Denying what we are also beneficiaries of the ongoing dispossession. We look on, we look at the structural problems and we refuse to bring any level of outreach to the dispossession, incarceration, of young women and men and removal of children all wrapped up in First Nations injustice. Number two, we join in shrugging shoulders. We are accepting of the place of the owners of the land. The First Nations people occupying the bottom of the pile, the bottom of the food chain. After all, there's someone beneath us. We can compare ourselves to them and see how much better we are or have become. We join in agreement with the morning breakfast host who dares to suggest that perhaps the stolen generation was not a bad thing after all. These are the narratives, the narratives that we have bought into. One of my, my indigenous friends con cautioned, be careful where you get your information from. And we all need to be careful where we get our information from. We take on board the narratives without questioning, without analyzing, because I was told by my colleague, my friend, it must be okay, it must be the truth. By default, we have complicit, we've been complicit in expropriating unceded land. We've come to possess without acknowledgement and paying respect. You know, not that one on the, this part of the spectrum, but real respect that ends us towards this part of the spectrum. 
We've come to pose, we've hardly stopped to question. We've hardly stopped to get to know. We are eager to avoid discomfort. We are happy to escape the dispossession and oppressions of our people, giving honor to the colonizer whose generosity has made it easy for us to access a better life in Australia or participate in ongoing colonial project. I am not responsible. This is what some of us run away from, the torment of powerlessness. Now it stares us in the face. Only this time, the shoe is on someone else's foot. And where can we escape to? Australian First Nations people have never run. They have stayed put, they call still here, and ceded land meaning still here. Their connection to the land, sovereignty, is a spiritual issue. The ancestral tie between the indigenous people and the land is so strong, there is no way of escape, so here we are. This is the basis of the ownership of the land, better still, sovereignty in the generosity. In their sovereignty, they say, this sovereignty has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. I say, how generous. In my one of my indigenous friends says, step on this land, you are home. And that's exactly what we are. We stepped on this land, and we are home. But what are we doing with it? The constitutional reform will empower indigenous people to take a rightful place in their own country, yet even at the stage of seeking, they wish to share. The least we can do is to heed the call. What should we do? What should we not say? This is important. What should we not say? Number one, we should not say I know how they feel. Do you? I do not know your personal story, nor the story of your community, but can you truly claim you know how they feel? I was removed from my dearest grandmother at the age of seven because my father wanted me to live with him. In the same country, in the same part of the country. My father didn't contend with the fact that I was a kid who slept in my grandmother's bosom every night. When I was taken away, I got very sick to the point of death. And somebody tapped my father on the shoulder and said, go bring that grandmother. And she came, and for six months, she nursed me back to life. My grandmother came, because she knew where to come. That with the removal of the Aboriginal children, grandmother didn't know where they took her. Didn't know where to go. Do you understand? Do you know how they feel? Hopelessness and utter powerlessness, that is what we don't fully understand. I come from another British colony. Mine was a treasure trove, was exploited, and we were left with on, with our own devices. In 1957, Gold Coast, then Ghana, gained independence. In 1960, Ghana became a republic. The First Nations of Australia were still not counted, not until 1967. Where were you in 1967? What is the colonial timeline of your country of origin? Do you really know how they feel? In 2017, we seeking a voice after many attempts at inclusion and many, many instances of denials and betrayals. How can you say we understand? History tells us that the elite of Gold Coast were born, the British-born educated merchants from the colony traveled to the British Parliament in the 1800s to lay a claim to the crown to say, don't touch the land in Gold Coast, because it's not empty land. It is, cannot be crown land. In Australia, all petitions through the Victorian and New South Wales government from the indigenous people were swept under the carpet, same time frame. How can you say you understand? Do you really know how they feel? Number two, 
Why can't they move on? Oh my God, don't say that. Don't. This is a response that smacks of arrogance, naivety, and ingratitude, specifically the epitome of disrespect. This is the sort of response you expect to get from the one who lived with in privilege all their lives and have no sympathy for people's pain and trauma. The First Nations story of brokenness, fragility, fragmentation, and trauma gets told all the time. If we dare to listen, and listening is one of the first things that First Nations people are asking for us to do. Annie Miriam Rose Angema, the 2021 Senior Australian of the Year said, our culture is different. We're asking you, fellow Australians, to take the time to know us and to be still and listen to us. My Aboriginal friends and sister who helped me to confront the pride in my culture taught me about fragmentation and brokenness to the point of inability to move on. So move on is not one of the things we should be asking indigenous people to do. What do you need to do? What needs doing? One, get a sense of obligation, will you? Towards the First Nations as the traditional custodians of the land. If your concept of image of Australia did not include First Nations people, if you came to Australia which is devoid of Aboriginal Australia, then it's time. It's time to do a 180 degree turnaround. There is a whole 3% of Australians to learn to link with. You are to find them to be, you will find them as warm, welcoming, generous, hospitable, and to acknowledge and connect in respect. It is time, it is now that we are reaching out and asking to participate in the Uluru Statement from the heart, work with us. How do we do that? Everybody talks about allies. So it's good to be an ally, but what kind of ally is an effective one? You know, I know about allies. The ones who stand by you and then at the critical point when you are blushing purple because something is going down really wrong, they turn around and say, don't be so sick. Sensitive. Really? Well, go home. Because I don't need you. Right? Why can't you move on? Well, that is not an ally that I want. I am calling for accomplices. The ones who are ready to listen and learn and stand beside and behind the First Nations as they take the lead and set the agenda. The agenda has been set. We need to fall behind as accomplices. We need to educate ourselves. This morning we've heard about the anti-racism strategy. We need to understand that the whole life of First Nations people, not only as multicultural people, is framed by racism. I told Mohammed, what's the wrong word to use? And I asked permission to use the R word, because if I don't use the R word, then I'm not who I am. Because I live it every day I get out of my front door. And the indigenous people do too. So we need to stand in that anti-racism posture. Get yourself a commun and your community prepared to participate in the referendum. Gain knowledge about the Uluru Statement from the Heart is beautiful. Pick up some of the strategies that are on the website. And I was going to share with you something on the PowerPoint, but can I move, get the next slide of the symbols, please? I love the symbols. The first two symbols this way for you is the symbol in my culture that says Sankofa, which means there's nothing wrong with going back to make up the mistakes of the past. I share that with us today. And we carry that to the indigenous community. So we made the mistakes in the past, but we will take advantage of that and come and say, we are sorry, we move with you together. We should have a, had a relationship. That is the last symbol. But you can't unravel. That symbol says unraveling 
the, the, the note of reconciliation. Well, if we didn't have a relationship, we cannot unravel that knot. Hopefully we had a relationship, and let's use wisdom to unravel that knot. Organizationally, FECA has signed the accord, so let all organizations multicultural follow suit. Aboriginal literature abounds. Read. I've read a couple of books in the last two weeks because I didn't want to come here thinking I know anything. Actually, I didn't know nothing. So listen to Aboriginal music. There's a lot of truth in there. And learn to understand why we do it and when next to do it and do it meaningfully. Work with us in the movement of the Australian people for a better future, they say. A movement of the Australian people, all of us. My last slide, please. We are, you are, we are, we are Australian. Will you heed the call? Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie Juliana. Thank you, Professor Neiman Davis. That was uh, an incredible keynote address. We heard the call, and uh, Auntie Juliana, um, I think you've inspired all of us to take action. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I am very cognizant that we are running very late, but this is a very important conversation. I'd like to take a couple of questions, um, and hopefully we can um, get to morning tea. Um, uh, Professor Davis, uh, how can we be good allies? What can we do practically as multicultural communities? Um, well, I, I like that concept of accomplice, accomplices. I really like that. That's cool. <laughs> um, so we might plagiarise that for our, for our campaign. <laughs> um, well, we do have a website, allarustatement.org. Um, so that's a really kind of, you know, initial thing. It'd be great for people to sign up um, because... We send out a lot of, you know, material and notices about what we're doing. But really, um, starting this conversation, um, as you know, Mo, we're really happy to come and visit organisations, provide speakers, resources, to start having this yarn right across the country with all of your member orgs. So um, I think, you know, I hope from today it will kickstart those conversations in communities um, uh, about the Uluru Statement and what's on offer because... There, there, there's going to be a referendum. We're, we're no longer lobbying and advocating for it. They've committed to it. Um, and so we now need to educate the community on that, um, including any questions people have about, um, um, about what the voice is, about you know, any differing views in the community um, and how, how, that, how that's managed. Um, you know, in 67, there was opposition to 67 from our own mob. There was opposition at the end of the bridge walk in 2000. There were mob protesting at the end saying no reconciliation. Like, we've always had community members that don't agree with things. But, um, but this, is, this is a real commitment to a change that Australia's never have had. Australia's never empowered our people through the Constitution. So um, it's, a, it's a big deal. And we need, um, you know, our brothers and sisters on side to help have this conversation and, and that's really what this is about it's the reach and the the community education the yarning beautiful thank you um auntie juliana some people might say we've got issues of our own <laughs> why are we focusing on this why should we focus on this what would you say to to that the indigenous people have asked us to walk with them. It's about healing. If you understand land, the land suffers and we all suffer. The indigenous connection with land is very strong. If this land does not heal, we will all suffer. So you got problems, we've all got problems. So let's band together to help heal this land so we can all grow and flourish. Um, there are a lot of, um, uh, I suppose, there is a question on Slido um, saying 
there's, we hear a lot of fragmentation within First Nations communities about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Where do you think that's coming from, Megan? Um, I think, well, there's, there's a few things. I mean, we, we have, like I said, we have differing views in the community. Um, so, so I wouldn't call it fragmentation because the focus is, for example, at Uluru, it's on the seven people who walked out and not the 250 who stayed in the room. So, you know, post the election, <coughs> the media is ringing up the people who are dissenting, um, but nobody wants to focus on the consensus. Um, some of those dissenters just didn't like the outcome. So there was a woman on Q&A. She'd been elected, she'd done the Dubbo Dialogue, was elected to the Uluru Convention, didn't like the outcome. And she doesn't support treaty or voice. You know, we, we have a cohort that are resistance mob who will always resist. And we respect that, but we don't think it should be a blocker for change in our community when we have so many issues that are so exigent from housing to unemployment to incarceration to health. We don't think this process should be stopped because of a few. Um, there, there's Then the state-based treaty processes um, have confused um, and are confusing, I think, to a lot of people about the coherency there in terms of treaty. Um, but treaty only started at a state level because there was nothing going on at a Commonwealth level. And so state um, governments, like Victoria, initiated treaties, but they're all Labor governments, and very few have been tested with a change of government. The, the reason why that matters is because treaty processes can fall over because State, state parliaments and state governments are, are vulnerable to not just the Commonwealth, but to that change at a state level. So it happened in South Australia. LNP, Labor sets it up, LNP gets in, pulls a plug, ALP's back in, setting it up again. Um, which is why you need the Commonwealth at the table in treaty processes. Um, Victoria is finding the same issue. Your treaty is very skewed if you don't have the Commonwealth at the table. And that's because of the Constitution. We have a federation in which the Commonwealth trumps states. That's the nature of our federation, not just in the text of the Constitution, but all of the jurisprudence of the High Court since. Um, it's a very lopsided treaty if you don't have the Commonwealth. And the state and territories can't countenance. They can't deal with sovereignty. The Commonwealth has to deal with that issue. So there's, there's a lot of confusion around the state-based treaty processes. But I would say the important thing about Victoria for the rest of the nation is before Victoria could treaty, it needed a voice, right? You can't... The threshold question of a treaty is who are you going to treat with? We're not talking about pan-Aboriginal treaties. We're talking about nation-based treaties. Um, and they had to set up an assembly. Um, and it's the same discussion and deliberation that happened in the dialogues around what is the infrastructure required, not, not looking at Canada and US and New Zealand saying, oh, let's adopt that, but what is Australia? What does it look like? What do our powers look like? What do the constitution look like? Constitutions. What do we have to do to, to set up the things that we've always wanted? Because Uluru is voice, treaty, truth. Like, it is about those things. That's what it is. It's, it's just some people feel, um, and it's a minority, some people feel truth has to come first, for example. But there's never been a treaty process in the world where you needed a truth commission first. You don't need to suspend or stop any work on our rights to do truth telling. There's substantive rights that should be recognised by the state. You don't need a truth process to do that piece of work. Um, the Truth Commission idea comes from a transitional justice process and practice in international law that, um, that says to transition a society to a peaceful environment, you need a Truth Commission to get there so perps and victims can live together under the rule of law. Now, that's been, that was imposed upon us in the reconciliation framework in the 1990s. But what the old people during the dialogues and at the Rock said was, Reconciliation is the wrong word. Reconciliation is not the right word for Australia um, because we have never met. It assumes there was a relationship beforehand and that we're just making friends again. 
And, and that was what our old people told us. Reconciliation is the wrong word. And, and that's a really important thing because there's a conflation now of transitional justice theory and practice. So truth plus justice equals reconciliation. A conflation of that with the original grievance or dispossession. And so we're getting, it's getting, it's, it is getting confusing for the community because the actual, Uluru is about the original grievance. It's about settling the unfinished business. So what happens after that initial step through the voice in terms of truth and treaty? Well, that's a process that the mob now have to design. The, you know, people shouldn't singularly impose their views about a truth commission or, or treaty upon the community. That process has to happen in a proper fashion after the referendum is, happens. But so, you know, there are some prominent voices who, who want the sequence disrupted. But, I mean, I can't do that. I, I just took people through a kind of two-year process where we said we respect the right to self-determination as Aboriginal people, and what you say, we have to respect. I can't disrupt that and say, oh, well, you know, my mum now wants a truth commission first. That's not how our community works. Um, and so... So, yes, there will be different views, but, you know, the polling that we've done over five years among our own communities is that 80% of our communities, First Nation communities, support Uluru and voice Treaty Truth. Because we've argued for these things since the 1840s, um, the, the, the majority of our people support this. Um, now, we respect people who dissent, and we respect people who want truth first and treaty first, but there are some big legal, technical, political challenges we have to just saying, we want treaty now. Like, it's not on the table at a Commonwealth level. What's on the table is an amendment to the Australian Constitution. Treaty can't be constitutional, and truth can't be constitutional. So the last point I wanted to make about truth is that, you know, when Bob Hawke promised a treaty, and Bob Hawke promised national land rights, his cabinet, the papers show his cabinet go, right, we've got a West Australian election, we can't lose it, we've got a dump treaty. What did, what did they choose to replace it? They chose a truth process, yeah? They kicked the can down the road on our rights for 10 years. We're not going to kick the can down the road on our rights for another 10 years to tell more stories to the Australian community about what they did. We've done truth-telling. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody is truth-telling. The bringing them home story is the truth telling. Um, the reconciliation process, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, that was 10 years of statutory truth telling. So when we got to all, we went to the dialogues, Mob said, we don't want to tell our stories anymore. We keep telling our stories. Look, Mob will tell their stories if there's a truth commission, but their point is an important one. Stop, the state keeps using truth as a way to not recognise our rights. And that's why truth was sequenced third, because we do not want this notion of truth to be put in the way of progress, because our people are dying, we have a lot of problems, and the country faces just an unfathomable crisis, right? And if we, our old people, I'll stop on this, Mo, because I know you're like, Megan, stop raining. Our old people, <laughs> at a lot of the dialogue said, we, we need peace for our country. Our people, and they meant the Australian people, cannot face what's about to come before them if this country is not at peace. And you can't... The way to get the country to peace is to face... The Australian people have to face up to the original grievance. And the Uluru sequence is the first step. We're asking Australians, we're asking you to meet us at the rock. We have some grievances we need to share with you and we're asking you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. And, and that is to persuade those politicians who are really scared of the Australian people, they're terrified of the referendum, to persuade them that it's OK, we are going to support it. That's what we ask people to go to their local MPs and say, it's OK. It's polled positively up to 60% for five years now. 
and, and no proposal for Aboriginal reform has ever done that. And it's because it's very simple. We're just asking to be at the table when laws and policies are passed about our lives. That is it. You know, we're not vetoing the parliament. We're, we're not in the parliament. We're just asking them to have us at the table when laws and policies are made. The vaccine rollout, they forgot to have us at the table. They literally forgot. They've just signed the Close the Gap Agreement, right, the version two, and they forgot to have an Indigenous entity or representative at the table for the vaccine rollout. Just didn't think of it. A constitutional right compels them. Constitutionally, they have to have us at the table. So now they have to think, oh, and we have to get someone from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to be there because the consequences of no one being at the vaccine rollout, of course, is that it ravaged our entire communities. Like, like everyone, people died, but in our discrete communities, people either died or got very, very sick because they do not think of us until the last minute. And that's all we're asking for. And I can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My... <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... you've, you've answered all of my questions. Um, <laughs> Um, we know what it's, uh, what it's like to be um, an afterthought, Megan. Um, we know. Um, one last question, and I will let you all out. Um, uh, Auntie Juliana, the referendum will come. What is your message to our communities? What is our role? What is our duty? The referendum will come. Please. Our job is to help our communities, our families, to understand why this referendum is coming and to educate our communities about what it means for all of us so that when it comes, we will vote effectively. We can't get this one wrong. Okay, thank you so much. Put your hands together for Professor Megan Davis and Auntie Juliana in Kuma.